Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and your host here on Last Week in the Church, where we harvest the fruits of the last week on the Vatican Beat. We're a day late this week, but I promise you we're not going to be a dollar short because we've got a lot to talk about. So we begin this week with reversal on Rupnik after more than a month in which it seemed that Pope Francis and his team wanted nothing more than to put the case of former Jesuit father Marco Rupnik, this famed Slovenian artist priest who's been accused of sexual abuse by about 25 adult women stretching over 30 years, that they wanted to put that case in the rearview mirror. Out of the blue, the Pope announced this week that he is actually lifting the statute of limitations in canon law to allow a prosecution of Rupnik. We'll explain maybe where that decision came from and what to watch for going forward. Second this week, we've got sayonara to the Senate. The Pope's keenly anticipated Synod of Bishops on Synodality wrapped up this past Sunday. Many observers would say it ended with more of a whimper than a bang, but we will nevertheless explain why that whimper could still be the basis of something big down the line. We'll unpack what's going on there. Third, we've got the winds of war. As the war between Israel and Hamas on the Gaza Strip continues to get bigger and bigger and more deadly, the Vatican's full court diplomatic press to try to play some kind of mediating role, some kind of role in the direction of bringing peace continues to unfold. We will bring you the latest there, including an interesting footnote about slightly dubious papal claims. And then finally, this week, we've got the church and welcome. The Pope's Synod of Bishops ended with a call for the Catholic Church to become more welcoming, inclusive, and compassionate. I'm going to try to explain why a small, relatively overlooked story out of northern Italy illustrates that in a certain sense, all of this is superfluous because the Catholic Church really has been in the welcoming business all along. All that and more is waiting for you on this edition of Last Week in the Church. So please, for the love of God, in the name of all the angels and the saints and everything that is holy, don't go anywhere. We will be right back. This is our official Last Week in the Church infomercial because I come to you with a special offer for all of those would-be Catholic eggheads out there. That is, if you're the kind of person who likes sounding smart, who likes creating the impression that you know things other people don't, that certainly describes me. If that describes you, you're going to want to know about this. Now, I've already spoken about this new app, this new online resource called Magisterium AI. Basically, what it allows you to do is to type in a question like, what does it mean that the Pope is infallible? Or what does the Catholic Church teach about the environment? Or, you know, whatever. And it will give you a short, smart, easily digestible answer based on more than 5,000 official magisterial texts. But recently, these guys have created a new feature on the app. It's called the Scholarly Mode which draws not just on official texts, but also the best and brightest of Catholic thinkers and theologians over the centuries, from Augustine and Aquinas to more contemporary figures. And we'll also give you a very quick answer about what those folks have had to say about what the church teaches on various issues. Now, I promise you that if you try this once, you're going to wonder how in God's name you ever lived without it. It's brought to you by our friends at Longbeard. They are the digital marketing design company that provide the IT backbone for Crux. They provide the same service for a slew of other Catholic organizations and outfits. They are they're brilliant, and they are creative, and they are tremendous. And I'm kind of out of adjectives at this point, which is saying something, because I traffic in adjectives. But I am telling you, these people are the absolute level best. So. Check it out. This is Magisterium AI, their new scholarly mode. You're going to dig it. Magisterium.com, that is Magisterium.com. It comes with my personal guarantee. (laughs) 
All right, everybody, happy Wednesday to you. Happy November 1st, which of course is All Saints Day on the Catholic calendar, so happy feast day to you. I apologize, normally this show comes out on Tuesday, but for circumstances beyond our control, we were delayed by 24 hours. But under the heading of Better Late Than Never, let us dive in. So we begin this week with reversal on Rupnik. So if you watch this show on a regular basis, or frankly, if you just have not been living under a rock for like the last two years, you would know that the case of Slovenian father Marko Rupnik is probably the most famous, or maybe more accurately said, infamous sexual abuse scandal in the Catholic Church at the moment. Rupnik, a Slovenian priest, used to be a member of the Jesuits, was kicked out by the Jesuits in June as a result of what have become a cluster of charges of sexual, psychological, spiritual abuse directed against him by about 25 adult women, most of them nuns, most of them members, either current or former, of an order of nuns in Slovenia for which Rupnik was sort of a sponsor and chaplain. This pattern of abuse, according to the alleged victim, stretches over about 30 years. This came to light last year when it was revealed that Rupnik had actually briefly been excommunicated by the Vatican's then Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, now the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, for the crime under church law of absolving a woman with whom he had had a sexual relationship, absolving her in the confessional. That excommunication was lifted just about two weeks after it was imposed under what remain somewhat mysterious circumstances. Ever since, there had been clamor for Rupnik to be prosecuted, but because the alleged victims in this case are not minors, the argument all along had been that he couldn't be prosecuted because the statute of limitations under church law, which is technically known as prescription, barred such a prosecution. And Really, for the last month and a half, it kind of seemed like that everybody in officialdom just kind of wanted this to go away. On September 15th, Pope Francis held a meeting with an Italian laywoman and theologian, Maria Campatelli, who is the kind of the director of a center here in Rome known as the Centro Aleti, the Aleti Center, which was founded by Rupnik and has always been a kind of carrier of his spirituality, particularly this idea of the intersection of Eastern and Western spirituality as expressed in art. So the Pope had this meeting with Campatelli, very friendly. Pictures were released afterwards. Campatelli has been a big defender of Rupnik. At one point, she said he was being subjected to a public lynching as a result of these abuse allegations. And so that struck a lot of people as a statement by the Pope saying he, you know, was at least maybe not completely on board with the idea that Rupnik was guilty. Three days later, the Pope's own Diocese of Rome, the Vicariate of Rome, released a report that they had commissioned from a canonist here in Rome, which basically said that the Centro Aleti is fine. They said that that has a healthy community life with no particular problems. And that report also said that there were grave procedural problems with that excommunication of Rupnik, casting doubt on whether it was legit from the very beginning. And of course, because this was the Pope's diocese and because the Vatican didn't say anything, there was kind of this assumption that the Pope if he hadn't directly signed off on it, was at least okay with it because nobody said he wasn't. And then, you know, we flash forward to just the last few days, it emerged that Rupnik had been incardinated, which is the technical term in church law, meaning given an official status, by a diocese in Slovenia, which meant that after he had been kicked out from the Jesuits, he now had a new official home And this diocese in Slovenia apparently was perfectly fine with him continuing to live and work in Rome and kind of do his thing. So the takeaway in many quarters was that Pope Francis and his team were just hoping this would all quietly go away, right? That it was kind of over. 
that obviously did not sit well with many of Rupnik's accusers. Several of them had issued an open letter along the way saying that this suggested that the church's talk about zero tolerance was just a hollow PR gesture. There was a constant drumbeat of criticism about it all. And apparently, that drumbeat was also heard inside the Senate of Bishops that took place here in Rome over October, because this past week, the Vatican put out an announcement which, frankly, caught all of us off guard. There was no advance warning that this was coming. And basically, what the statement said was the Pope had decided to lift that statute of limitations in canon law, that is, to waive prescription so that a canonical case could be opened against Rupnik, and said that if there was one thing that he had heard clearly during the Synod, it is the voices of those who have suffered in the church, the voices of the marginalized, had to be heard. The suggestion is this was an example of the Pope trying to hear them. Okay, now, what this statement did not indicate is when this case against Rupnik is going to be opened. It did say it would be handled by the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith, but did not indicate who in the dicastery is going to be responsible for it. And it also did not tell us which charges are going to be considered. Again, there are multiple complaints. We don't know if they are all going to be part of this prosecution, or if only a few of them for various legal or procedural reasons will be considered. We don't know any of that. So we're waiting for many of those details to be filled in. Here's what we can say in the meantime in terms of immediate takeaways. Number one, this news, while welcome in many quarters, clearly hasn't satisfied everybody. Five of Rupnik's accusers, that is five women who have accused, directly accused Rupnik of abuse, put out a statement which was reported by the Italian newspaper Domani, which means tomorrow, basically saying that they hope, and they didn't say they're convinced, they said they hope this will be a suitable step that will lead to the truth finally being recognized. Very brief, and obviously not a kind of full-throated endorsement that they have total confidence that this is all going to work out properly. Other advocacy groups for victims of clerical sexual abuse expressed much deeper skepticism. Groups such as Ending Clergy Abuse, the Survivors Network of Those Abused by a Priest, issued statements saying they don't understand why the Pope has to intervene to lift the statute of limitations in the first place. It should just be automatic. They also said that, you know, church law already says that it's not just minors, but also vulnerable adults who should get this kind of treatment. Obviously, nuns who are subject to the influence of a world-famous, papally beloved, powerful priest are vulnerable individuals, and they would argue that this should have happened a long time ago. So, number one, while I think I haven't heard from anybody who would suggested that this probably isn't a positive thing, that is, that there will be a serious investigation, there is nevertheless a residue of skepticism about where it's all going to lead. Perhaps the second thing that should be said is that on the basis of that residue of skepticism, Pope Francis is going to face increased pressure, not simply to prosecute Rupnik. I mean, in a way, that is the easy part of all of this, but to provide a more comprehensive explanation of how we got to this point. I mean, if I can quote the movie Tombstone, okay, there is a famous scene in the movie Tombstone in which Wyatt Earp pops up off a riverbank and basically walks on water to take out the bad guys. And afterwards, you know, his guys are saying, what in the world happened there? And one of them says, if I were him, I'd want revenge too. And Doc Holliday says, make no mistake, what he's after isn't revenge. It's a reckoning. Well, I think many abuse survivors, including the alleged victims of Rupnik, it's the same thing. They don't just want revenge. They want a reckoning. They want to know how the system brought them to this point, which means that Pope Francis is going to have to explain not merely 
whether he was involved in the lifting of that ex excommunication of Rupnik, why it has taken him this long to authorize a canonical process, why his own diocese could give Rupnik's center a clean bill of health with no reaction of any visible sort from the Pope or from the Vatican, why he gave this audience to one of Rupnik's key allies. I mean, people want answers to those questions, but I think it will spiral out from there. Like, you know, how do we explain, for example, the Pope's conduct with the Zanchetta case, this Argentine bishop who had been accused of sexual and financial abuse in Argentina and then was brought to the Vatican and given a sinecure and apparently a clean bill of health until he was criminally indicted in Argentina, prosecuted, and then sentenced. All of these questions are going to continue to fester, and I think what has happened is that in a way the Pope has opened a Pandora's box in which the questions he is going to face pressure to answer are going to be numerous and will probably occupy a great deal of his time and attention. All right, we will obviously continue to follow all of that. All right, second up this week, sayonara to the Senate. So the Pope's keenly anticipated, much ballyhooed, much hyped Synod of Bishops on Synodality has come and gone. It began on the 4th of October, closed on Sunday the 29th with a mass presided by Pope Francis. Its primary work products were issued this past week. On Wednesday, we got a letter from the Synod to the people of God. And late Saturday night, and I want to emphasize late, we got the final report from the Synod, a 42-page document technically styled as a synthesis, which provided kind of a photograph of its discussions. It was organized in terms of kind of summaries, then areas of consensus, areas of disagreement, and proposals going forward. And basically speaking, if you were the kind of person who was expecting that this synod was going to end with dramatic decisions on hot button issues, that is, that it would once and for all settle things like, oh, I don't know, whether the Catholic Church ought to give blessings to same-sex unions, whether it ought to ordain women deacons, you know, whether lay people ought to be made heads of Vatican departments, or I don't know, whatever your particular issue was. If you were expecting conclusions, on those issues, you are going to be sorely disappointed by the results of the Senate because, basically speaking, on every contentious issue in the life of the church, the Senate, if I can put it this way, basically punted. What it said was, we discovered disagreements on these issues. Now, they would, they would immediately rush to say that these disagreements were voiced with deeply respectful, collegial, and synodal tones. But nevertheless, it was clear that there were strong disagreements on these contested issues. And so basically what they did is called for more conversation and study ahead of the next Synod of Bishops in October 2024. The net result? Well, let me put it to you this way. One leading Spanish news outlet described this as the decaffeinated synod, that is the synod in which all the like strong stuff was drained out before we got its final result. Specifically with respect to the letter to the people of God issued Wednesday night, which by the way, not only didn't mention any contentious issues, but it also didn't mention the context of wars in Ukraine and Gaza as the synod was meeting, one veteran Italian reporter, a dear friend of ours, Gianfranco Soldati, closed her piece on this letter to the Senate of God, which struck her as incredibly anodyne and detached from the reality of the situation. She closed it with the line, reporting from the planet Mars, back to you. So look, this is where we are. I mean, you know, all along, in fairness, Participants in the Synod in these Vatican-organized briefings, and by the way, my wife Elise got a jump start on Lent because she went to all of these briefings, like to work off time in purgatory or something, because it's not like you were going to learn anything, but she nevertheless did out of a hyperdeveloped sense of duty. 
And if you read her reports, what these people were saying all along is don't expect results. Don't expect concrete outcomes. This is all about a new style of being church in which we're going to listen and consult and dialogue. But, you know, results are down the line. And so in that sense, you have to give them credit for honesty because they told us not to expect results. And in fact, we didn't get any results. So basic message here is we will have to wait for October 24 and see what that next edition of the Synod may produce. In the meantime, what we have is an invitation to continued conversation, consideration, and although they didn't say this out loud, maybe consternation over these divisive issues. We will see where it all leads. All right, third up this week, we have the winds of war. Obviously, the war between Israel and Hamas on the Gaza Strip continues to be the world's dominant news story as we speak. The latest count is that something like 1,400 Israelis have been killed, most of them, in that sneak attack by Gaza on October 7th that began all of this. Officials in Gaza are claiming that something like 8,500 people in Gaza have been killed so far. Now, those numbers are disputed in some quarters, but I don't think anybody seriously argues that this has not been a tremendously lethal and bloody conflict so far. As we speak, Israeli, Israel has already made some ground incursions in Gaza and is apparently ramping up for a sort of broadened offensive to try to bring this war to a conclusion. Now, as all of this is going on, what we have is the Vatican trying to continue what amounts to a diplomatic full court press to try to bring peace, to try to bring some kind of resolution to this conflict, just to briefly tick off what we have seen. On Sunday, this past Sunday, during his traditional noontime Angelus address, Pope Francis issued, well, I mean, he began by repeating his calls for the release of Israeli hostages that have been seized by Hamas and also the opening of humanitarian corridors to bring humanitarian aid to Gaza to ward off what many observers have described as a looming catastrophe. But then he also issued a strong, obviously ardent, obviously heartfelt appeal for an immediate ceasefire. I want to add a slightly amusing, and I know there's really nothing funny about a situation in which people are being butchered, but just a slightly amusing footnote to all of this. What the Pope actually said, apropos of a ceasefire, is that before coming out to give the Angelus, he had just been watching a program on Italian TV called A Sua Imagine in his image. Basically, it's on Rai. That's the Italian national broadcaster. And what they do is about a half hour or so every Sunday before the Angelus, they come on and they have some people who talk. Then they listen to the Angelus and then they continue to talk about it afterwards. So the Pope said he'd been watching that show before he walked out you know, to the window of the papal apartment and said he had heard this priest, Father Ibrahim Fawas, who is the vicar of the Franciscan custody of the Holy Land, call for a ceasefire. And the Pope said he wanted to echo that appeal, that he agreed with Father Ibrahim. Now, what's slightly amusing about this is that a few years ago, Pope Francis gave an interview in which he said he hadn't watched television since 1990. And yet, he is forever citing things that he just saw on TV. Now, I think we're supposed to presume what he means is he hasn't watched like entertainment, like he's not watching, you know, I don't know, the Housewives of Jersey City or NCIS or something. But in any event, it is a reminder that one of the things about this pope is that he will often say things that are tremendously charming, but also a little bit imprecise, which drives some people crazy and makes other people fall in love with him. Anyway, it is what it is. Point is, in his Angelus address, the Pope echoed this appeal for an immediate ceasefire. In addition, the Pope provided, presided over a prayer service in St. Peter's Square on October 27th, praying for peace in the Holy Land. And also on October 29th, the Latin Rite Patriarch of Jerusalem, Cardinal Pierre Battista Pizzaballa, presided over another prayer service in which he consecrated the Holy Land to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, obviously with the idea 
of asking for Mary's intervention to bring peace. Now, in addition to prayer, Vatican diplomacy continued to be active. Also this week, Iran's Ministry for Foreign Affairs requested a phone conversation with British Archbishop Paul Gallagher. Gallagher is the Vatican's foreign minister, basically. And according to a readout of that conversation provided by the Vatican, Gallagher emphasized the importance of not escalating the conflict in the Gaza Strip, also reiterated the Vatican's support for a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian problem, and, you know, I mean, basically indicated the Vatican's willingness to try to be helpful in any way it possibly could. Now, what's important about this, remember, it was the Iranian foreign minister who requested this conversation. The Vatican didn't initiate it. I mean, everybody knows, of course, that Iran is one of the principal sponsors of Hamas. There is great concern that if Israel, Israel's operations in the Gaza Strip uh, ratchet up, that Iran might choose to become involved, which could very rapidly make this a much broader regional, if not even global, conflict. The fact that Iran gave the Vatican the opportunity to weigh in on that prospect is significant and indicates that they take the Vatican seriously as a diplomatic player and a potential mediator in this conflict. I would remind you, by the way, that Iran and the Holy See actually have always had very close relations. Let me point out that Iran has had diplomatic relations with the Holy See since 1954, which is 30 years before the United States got around to having diplomatic relations with the Holy See. Iran is also a majority Shia Muslim nation. The Shia branch of Islam and the Catholic branch of Christianity have a number of kind of, oh, I don't know, almost physiognomical features in common from a clerical caste to devotions to angels and saints and so on. And so it is entirely possible that as this situation plays out, Iran might look to the Holy See, look to the Vatican, as basically the only historically Western institution it can actually trust and might want the Holy See to play some kind of role in trying to craft an exit strategy from this conflict. We don't know how that's going to play out, but it's interesting. One other note I would add is that after Pope Francis conducted this October 27th prayer for peace, the chief rabbi of Rome, Riccardo de Segni, published an opinion piece in Corriere della Sera, which is basically the New York Times of Italy, right? It's sort of the paper of record. Not exactly criticizing the papal prayer, but certainly raising questions about it, saying, hey, look, nobody is against peace. And prayer for peace is, is always a good thing. But, you know, you have to be careful. This prayer for peace doesn't become an excuse for legitimizing barbarism and sort of canceling moral differences between the two sides. Just a kind of reminder of the delicate diplomatic balancing act the Vatican is trying to walk as this conflict unfolds. All right, finally this week, the church and welcome. So the Synod of Bishops, one of its top notes, probably its single top note, was the idea that the Catholic Church ought to become more welcoming, more inclusive, more compassionate, especially to people who are on the margins. Now again, who would dispute that? But there is a story out of Northern Italy this week that illustrates, in a way, <laughs> It's kind of a superfluous call because this is sort of what we've been doing from the very beginning. The story is this. On Monday, there was a funeral in the northern Italian town of Grosseto. It's a town of about 80,000 people located in northwestern Italy on the Tyrrhenian coast for a local guy by the name of Beppe Prevosti. Now, Prevosti's story is this. He grew up in Brescia. That's the hometown of John XXIII, by the way. As a young man, he had a good job, was making plenty of money, but then he developed a gambling problem, blew out all of his cash, ended up living on the streets. He bounced around from a number of other Italian towns, eventually tried to get on a train to Naples, but he couldn't afford the ticket, so the conductor on the train kicked him off at their next stop, which turned out to be Grosseto. That's where he basically ended up. He was sleeping under an archway 
in the center of town begging for money. And locals sort of took, them under his, took him under their wing. They liked him. He seemed like a nice guy. He was always reading a book, so they would talk to him about what he was reading. One day, a Franciscan priest who was part of a Franciscan community at the Church of St. Francis in, Gris in Grisetto was passing by, asked if he could take Provosti to lunch. The two men hit it off. Provosti ended up living with the Franciscans for a while. They introduced him to a couple that was looking for somebody to take care of a couple of elderly relatives. So they gave him a job and a place to live. He got back in his feet. He became a very active member of this parish community, beloved by everybody. He would hang around the parish. He would be the guy who would open the door when somebody else came asking for help. He would always bring gelato when there were parish meetings. And so when he died, the whole town turned out because they loved this guy. They had opened their arms to him, and he became one of theirs. My point, you multiply that by a thousand, ten thousand, a million times. That is the story of the Catholic Church over the ages. Should we become more welcoming? Of course we should. Have we had a deficit of welcoming over the centuries? I don't think so. And I think the Bepi Provosti story illustrates it. All right, that is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site. That is cruxnow.com. We will be back here next, next week, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, have a fantastic and blessed week. We will talk to you again very soon.